Hi, and welcome to Talk Word. I'm Marty Dundix, Editor-in-Chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine, and this is Talk Word, a fun little podcast where professionally funny people come and tell awkward and cringeworthy stories, and I'm super excited for today's guest um, because I've never met her in person, yet we've communicated on the online world of comedy and Twitter and email for like over two years at least. Yeah. And um, you're in my office. You're here in the studio. Yeah, you're here at Weekly Humorous. We did it. I feel like we really did it. I know. It's Brooke Preston, everybody. Hilarious Woo-hoo. comedy writer, extraordinaire, new author yeah. of uh, brand new. a brand new book called New Erotica for Feminists, Satirical Fantasies of Love, Lust, and Equal Pay, uh, co-written by Caitlin Conkle, Fiona Taylor, Carrie Whitmer, and Brooke Preston, who's right here. I'm Welcome I'm on to talk that. Word. That's me. I know. Your name. I did it. It's in bright neon letters. That was that was not our first cover. <laughs> <laughs> so that's we're going to talk all about um, writing a book for the first time, the process of writing a book, and just you as a comedy writer. And you are from Ohio. I am. So you're in born and raised, big New York City. Yeah. Well, I lived in New York City after college for like two years. Okay. Uh, and I did the starving artist thing. Yeah. I thought I knew I wanted to be in New York, and I knew I wanted to be. Um, like sort of near entertainment at, at large, yeah. but I didn't have like a specific idea of what that was because growing up in Ohio, you're just like, so if I want to be on SNL, like does Lauren just call you <laughs> like at some point? <laughs> you're like, like how I, does that work? At you least don't... I know I'm not supposed to be in Ohio to make this happen. Yeah, so like I I'm... had the general idea of like, I think I'm supposed to be here to make this happen. Right. Um, and it turns out that is not how it works. Um, sadly, I was here for two years and he, did not call. <laughs> so you were in New York for two years after college? Yeah. And where did you go to college? Ohio University. Ohio go Ohio University. Mm-hmm. Not to be confused with Ohio State University. Or as the football players call it, the Ohio State University. The Ohio State, State University, University. Uh, it, which I now live in Columbus, and we are very much Ohio State football fans. Yeah. But yeah, Ohio University in Athens, which is sort of like this lovely little... Um, it's like an enclave of southeastern Ohio that's like surrounded by like Appalachia light, mm-hmm. but it is like this leftover hippie town from the 60s that never really decided to move past that. To not be in the 60s? Yeah, and it's kind of great. So That it's sounds like, like, a, like, a, like a wonderland. It is a wonderland, and it's a lovely place to go back to. It's a really special place, and if you see on like an electoral map, mm-hmm. um, it's like a place that's very deeply confusing to Wolf Blitzer <laughs> and Peter, or like... Uh, Does it just go either way? No, anytime? it's very blue, but they oh, don't know blue. why. Like, okay. So they're like, oh, um, here's Cleveland and Columbus and Cincinnati, and those are the blue areas in Ohio, and what's this little guy? And we're always like, Athens! <laughs> like, they're like, what's in the water there? Yeah, they're like, that's strange. Like, what an anomaly. And we're like, no. No, that's Athens. And you were you were in New York City for two years. Two years. So you went from from school. Mm-hmm. You came to New York to be a, a comedy star. I came to be something. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I've been a lifelong comedy nerd. So, but I don't. Again, I just wasn't quite sure how to translate that. Like, like one, comedy nerd is, to me is SCTV reruns. Yeah. That kind of comedy, yes. nerd. like Deep, old school, like deeply, Eugene like Levy, every, John Candy. Well, like I would sneak down when Conan, Late Night with Conan O'Brien first became mm-hmm. a thing. I was in, I think, junior high, sixth or seventh grade. Yeah. And then I would sneak down to the basement after my parents would go to sleep to watch that because of the sketches and the, you know, I liked the guests and things too, but I really liked the... Masturbating bear. Yeah, all of it. Classy stuff. Real, real highbrow stuff. <laughs> real highbrow stuff. Um, yeah, so... I loved all of that. I loved SNL. I still love SNL. I think it kind of gets a bad rap. But um, people are always mean to SNL. And it's still the been, cool thing to say that it used at, to be better than it is, which but, sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not true. But that's always true for anything. You know, you, yeah. if you, you could find uh, news reports in the 80s criticizing SNL in the 80s that it's not as good as the 70s. Right. You know, and then in the 90s, it wasn't as good as the 80s. Well, also, I think they're intentionally trying to, there's an intentional thing where they're trying to do some highbrow things, some absurdist things, some really broad or topical things. Yeah. And they want there to be something for everyone in one episode. Right. And so if someone turns it on as like not their thing, they just assume it's all not their thing. Yeah. Like it's... so there's definitely pieces in each episode where I'm kinda like, that didn't work for me. Yeah. Not <laughs> Because, you know, in my position of power, I'm just like, oh, yeah, no, that didn't work for me. But um, you know, I go and I hit, that I hit this hit. red button that <laughs> I have, right. yeah, and I'm like, right. hey, Lauren, this sucks. Uh, yeah, I send strongly worded letters. Um, and 
<laughs> Maybe that's why he doesn't call. That would be fun if that actually still exists um, with the old Nielsen rating system used to be like a button yes. that was attached to your television we, and you'd be like, no. When I lived <laughs> in New York, we were a Nielsen like family. Yeah. My roommate and I got asked to do it because you get paid. I don't know, some paultry amount. It's like to do $5. It. Yeah, oh, it's little. <laughs> it's a little amount, but we were like, yes, please, money. So we um, we lived in a studio apartment in the Upper East Side. First, we lived in Roosevelt Island before it was cool. And so we were Isn't just... Roosevelt Island like a psychiatric, an ex-psychiatric hospital ward? Yes. Yeah, but it, when it we was lived like... there, I think it was a current psychiatric yeah. Oh, really? Ward. Well, I, well, it was like two long-term care hospitals yeah. where people that didn't really know what to do with their loved ones that were in that camp Mm -hmm. um would just sort of leave them and so it was like we went in being nice midwesterners with the the nicest of intentions like being like we're gonna just be the people that are just like hi neighbor like we love you no matter what and then after about like your third trip to gristides the one gristides on the island which is like the saddest gristides where you go and you're like just trying to get your soup and you're like ten dollars of groceries because you're poor and like we went and everyone is not only you know in a adaptive state where they're either in a wheelchair or something right. like that but it would be like you know i'm on a, a bed with like a mirror and it, some more serious yeah. things happening which you would think like oh that's horrible and you have all the compassion in the world for them but then when that's every one that you interact with yeah. on the island after a while you're like well this is horrible it's and i'm now a place for uh, a yeah. new new yorker to be experiencing new exactly. york like, through oh Roosevelt i was totally island. like the girl off the bus that's like yeah. i have big dreams and yeah. then everyone's like, oh, honey, no. It all depends on where you first start, I think, in New York. Because I came here, I went to Syracuse, and I came here, and I just happened to luck into, like, Park Slope, oh. which is a lovely neighborhood. Lovely. Right? I'm staying there with Caitlin. You're down the street from me. I, I, I live right down the street from I her. I know. That's wonderful. Ah. Yeah, it's it's a very um, iconic, like, to me, when you think of New like York Brownstone, and Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's like uh, how people uh, lovingly used to think of the Cosby show. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's just like yes. creep, creep. I started to say that and I'm like, oh, God, I don't <laughs> want to bring Cosby into this. It's going to really wreck the moon. Uh, well. But yeah, that's a hundred. It's like idyllic yeah. when Cosby stoops. was good. Yep. Mm-hmm. Sto- stoops. A lot of stoops. A lot of stoops. And so that so, was lovely. So but... you came to New York. You you tried to be in comedy. And what did you do in New York in that time to, to be into comedy? Did you do the uh, like the UCB? So did that's you kind of my pit? greatest regret. I could, okay. Like I didn't really have the money at the time. Or I, And you know, when you're working those um, non-professional jobs and you're just starting out, you have such a varied schedule. Like you kind of have to be there when they say to be mm-hmm. there. And you get your schedule like the day before and it's always shifting. So that wasn't so much an option for me although i wish i would have just been like i'll clean toilets like i'll make it happen you know and so that's kind of a regret for me that i i should have started this so much sooner because i knew it was something that needed to be like part of my life yeah but i think in my mind at 23 i was like i'll always be here i'll obviously always live in new york i'll just have lots of chances to do this so it will be fine i have plenty of time and then um so i worked at planet hollywood in times square as the door host the person with the megaphone oh wow (laughs) across from the naked cowboy he's he's cool um he makes a ton of money by the way he goes to the bank like four or five times a day to deposit all of his like boot cash a lot of boot cash a lot of boot cash um but he was chill um but yeah so my job was to scream into a megaphone Mm -hmm. the same spiel day and night for plan i had to audition at that that. at that planet hollywood if i'm if i'm not mistaken is the life-size naked sly stallone statue I don't From... know if it was there at the time, okay. but it probably is now. Um, but yeah, it was at the time. It was no, like... it's not. I'm sorry. It's a lifetime. It's the naked uh, 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger from Terminator. That's, That's 100% what it is. right. Yes. Yes. Um, and then I eventually get to move inside to be a hostess. And it, there's a car from like a Sylvester Stallone movie like Hang suspended yeah. over you at all times. So you're just <laughs> like, at risk of death for $10 an hour. <laughs> which is amazing did but you was... pop by the planet hollywood since you've been in town i have not i don't think i i think i'm persona non grata from there i uh was fired <sighs> from planet i was the only job i'm ever fired from what was what did you do at planet hollywood to get canned from planet hollywood <laughs> i was late twice Oh, that doesn't seem like fun at all. No, and once was during the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. It would have been something. It's Try like, getting there on like time I, during I the Macy's stole Thanksgiving a, Day Parade. I stole a proton pack from the wall. Oh, God. I wish I would have gone out differently. Yeah. I'm like, I'm taking these sync outfits exactly. and you can't stop me. <laughs> I'm going to wear Chris Kirkpatrick's green suit and I'm going to wear it out and screw all of you. Um, yeah, it was, like, it was an interesting place. And the same thing played on a loop every 45 minutes. Yeah. So that'll make you nuts. Yeah, definitely. 
I used to I used to work at Letterman, and I would be giving out free tickets to tourists, mm-hmm. and I would hang out in that Times Square area, mm-hmm. also right by the Naked Cowboy. Mm-hmm. I used to call it my corner office because I'd be standing on the street corner. Yes. Of course, uh, and I was making it. Yeah, yeah. I felt very I was like this. Is even so though I sad. worked at, I, so the fact that I had to audition made me feel legit. Like I was like, I had to audition for this. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in the business, pretty much in in it, and yeah, in the business. And like I can see the naked cowboy, and he's been on TV. So that's I'm pretty much there, and that is the job. The only salvageable piece of that other than some good friends that I still have from that time in my life where we were like starving artists together is that I did meet Justin Timberlake at that job. Did you? And I got to take him to the bathroom and like not inside but I got to take him to the door of the restroom <laughs> uh, very unexpectedly and this is 2003 Yeah. so I mean that's like at the height mm-hmm. this is like the height of my JT. I was single I was ready for it. Anything was possible yeah, and <laughs> all doors were open <laughs> And uh, in my Planet Hollywood, like, baseball tee and, and uh, you know, like, orthopedic safety shoes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I got to be in a lo- alone in a room with Justin Timberlake for two minutes. Because we That's went awesome. to the private, like, banquet area so no one would what? bother him. Wow. He was lovely. He smelled nice. He was tall. I bet. At the time, it was like, I was like, this is the greatest day of my life. And nothing will ever top that. You still tuck that away, though. I mean, it is what it is. You know, yeah. it was good. Yeah. It was like... Good for the moment. Mm-hmm. Like it was the right, it was the right celebrity experience for the right moment. Yes, it's not the right celebrity experience for 2018. Right, but it was the right one for but 2003 it's... when I was 23. Hey, it's better than if it was like Robert Duvall. Well, the first person I met when I moved, to <laughs> I got New York to take City, Robert Duvall to the men's room. I mean, it that's kind of an amazing story. <laughs> I kind of wish that was the case. <laughs> like I wish that would have been true. The first person I met in New York at all, my friend and I from college, we moved here. We put our stuff down and we're like, let's go find jobs. We take our little resumes and we're like ready to go. We're walking in Times Square and I see this guy and I'm like, he's really tall. Like he looks like someone. Oh, that's John Mayer. <laughs> and there so, you go. That's and because I am who I am, and my friend was at, again, it's 2003. So mm-hmm. like, let's give context to this yeah. story. So my friend um, who was very into him at that time, I was like, I'm going to. I'm going to be the friend. Like, I'm going to be the wingman that does this. So I'm like, excuse me, hi, are you John Mayer? And he's like, I am. So we, like, sat and chatted with him in Times Square or, like, just off of it for, like, 15 minutes. He was lovely. That's awesome. He flirted with my friend. It was great. That's and at the delightful. time, it seemed very non-problematic and fine. I, I mean, I guess maybe I'm stuck in a time a time where because I'm old and, and I, I think I stopped – remembering or caring about celebrity at around 2007 yeah like no. things stopped registering for them. right so people would tell stories of like you know putting in context i'm like that is the only context that's i the, know that's, <laughs> it, that's it but like it was like the you want to meet the right celebrity yeah. at the time they're peaking that's true that yeah these so are like all that the was top. like a good time yeah. to meet him and he was lovely yeah but yeah and so that was like such a good like for us we're like this is going to be new york for us it's going to be like this Every all day. the time Every day. And you be, stayed for two years. I stayed for two years. I worked, um, so I worked that job. I worked a lot of internships. I worked like one or two day internships that were very exciting for like MTV. I was like, I worked for MTV Made sometimes as an intern, nice. like a casting intern, yeah. but not for long. You know, they would, they would just be like, come down for a day or yeah. come down for two days. And then um, I got paid $40 once to stand outside of TRL um, with a poster for mm-hmm. someone I had no idea who they were and be like, woo! So that was a good day. Yeah. <laughs> so just real high end. That was a hugely popular show. High right end there in entertainment. Times yeah. Uh, high end entertainment stuff. Uh, and then uh, I worked at a political nonprofit that was eventually dissolved into Move On Pack called uh, Music for America. Okay. So I did that. I was like a state coordinator for them. And at this time, are you doing any comedy writing? Not really. I mean, yes, but just not sending it anywhere. So you're comedy writing, but you're not submitting. But yeah, I had like a doing... big notebook of ideas. I wrote sketches. I was part of a sketch troupe in college. Okay. And so it was very much part of my life, but I just, and I was going to see a lot of comedy. So I was okay. like in it. Like I would go to UCB like several times a week. Me too. But I never did anything about we it. We were like in I went the same to, audiences, I bet. Probably. Definitely. I went to ASCAT a number of times because it was free. At the, like, it you was could wait free. in line you for the free one. I would go to that Or you one. could pay to the other. Right. I went to the free one. So we were probably just like hanging out in line together. They had a ton. I mean, they would get... and I Incredible. Maybe cast. they still do. They moved the whole UCB thing to this weirdo theater that's mm-hmm. much nicer, but it's so far away. Yes. Um, but the old school Chelsea one... This is the one, one under Gristides or I whatever loved that it. is. That was yeah. a great theater. That was awesome. It was a former like porn theater was it yeah that makes sense i, I read could see i that. think it was amy poehler's book where they talk about like 
first buying or renting that space and yeah. having to like clean it, I out. it a lot. and talking about how that's so disgusting. Very finding things that you just can't forget. It but, was amazing to go to the, uh, those Ask Cat shows. You would go and it would be like Amy Poehler incredible and it would be cast. like. Uh, Current SNL cast members and uh, late night people and yes, you know. so I feel like I was collecting a lot of comedy experiences that now still influence me. So it, mm-hmm. it wasn't like for nothing, but I definitely wasn't performing. And I was doing some my first freelance writing, just like music reporting or entertainment reporting freelance. And um, I worked uh, as Speewack, the like the coat uh, streetwear company. I was a PR oh, really? person, like an intern for them okay. for a while, paid intern. And so like I just did a variety of. Odd jobs. Yeah. I worked at Cold Stone Creamery for a while and sang for tips. Did you? Yeah, on the Upper East Side. So, like, I was really, I did. So, the show that I went to, that um, I went to Conan O'Brien's 10th anniversary special okay. at the Beacon. Mm-hmm. That was amazing. I went to the show that still to this day, I'm like, that was one of the best things I've ever done. Um, they do you remember soundtracks live at UCB? They did, yeah. they tried the show where they like, yeah, did the live soundtrack to 80s movies mm-hmm. and then they. My understanding of it is basically reenacted an 80s movie, like a John Hughes movie from memory or something sort right. of like, like a real drilled down, like a dumbed down version of it. Yeah. So they had, they were taping a pilot of that at Beacon Theater. They filled it up with a live audience and the cast was incredible. And it's almost like apocryphal because people don't believe me that all these people were in one thing. Mm-hmm. But it was Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Paul Rudd, most of the people from the state, mm-hmm. which I was huge MTV, yeah. the state. Were you a fan of the state i like the state i like the uh, i did so many good shows uh they had the original john stewart show which only lasted like one season yeah, it was so good it was so good and uh yeah just so like all of those people yeah. from that time were all in it together and um and more and it was just one of those special and they did 16 candles oh cool <laughs> um and it was just such a special thing to see all those people really not even like at their famous levels yet. Like I yeah. have no idea. I don't think I knew who Paul Rudd was at that time. But okay. looking back and seeing the pictures from it and being like, oh, yeah. you were really young and yet you look the same. Exactly, exactly the, same. the same. Like oddly the same. Oh, like he sleeps in Tupperware or he something. absolutely has a deal with a witch. Yeah. Like 100%. That's not natural. Yeah. He is like a Benjamin Button in, but he's not really doing anything. <laughs> It's, it's not like happening. the opposite of Benjamin Button. He's just doing nothing. It's Yeah, there's no aging. He's not aging in reverse. Do you think reverse. it will happen all at once? Or yes. do you think like... One day he'll wake up and be like, "No, I'm just, 75." Yeah, he'll just become an old person. We won't know that it's Paul Rudd. But he'll be <laughs> he'll like, just, and then he'll just fade into the be, normal guy. people. Yeah, yeah he'll just be like 95 one day. I think I feel like I don't know him, but I feel like it would that he would be okay with that. <laughs> he'd be like, "Thanks, man." That's yeah, nice. he'd be like, "I got enough time. It's yeah, cool. It's fine." That's amazing. Uh, so yeah, I feel like I I took a lot in in terms of the comedy scene mm-hmm. and learned by osmosis in yeah. that sense, like yeah. from all the ass cats, just seeing people do it at the very height. Right. But I was too timid at the time to jump in and feel. I, I just think I just felt like a going from a really really small town and then a smaller. You know, I mean, it's a big school, but like I still felt like it was close to home, and yeah. I felt very comfortable at my college. So. Moving to New York, I think I wasn't able to put a finger on this, but I felt very outclassed. So now, when do you move home to Ohio? Uh, I move home after John Kerry does not get elected okay. because the political nonprofit I was making a whole $800 a month from was like, we can't pay you anymore because John Kerry lost. Oh, John Kerry. Oh, John Kerry. I blame him. Um, and at the time, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go home. I'm going to earn a bunch of money and come back and do this the right way. Yeah. I'm going to go home for like, I put all my stuff in storage, all my stuff. I put my Papa's on chair <laughs> and my like two crates of stuff. And I just was like, I'm going to just, this is a hiatus. I'm right. going to go home. And I had been like really sick because I didn't have health insurance. And regroup. <laughs> go regroup and I'm going to come back and kill it yeah. with a plan. And then I never went back. Never went back. <laughs> no, I met my husband, and I got a job at an um, entertainment paper that my best friend worked at and was like, we need a writer. Perfect. And I was like, great. And then that led to a full-time job entertainment reporting at a Alt Weekly in Columbus. And then oh, just what Alt went Weekly? from there. Uh, Columbus Alive. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was I good. used to do, when I first thing. came to the city... I did newspaper illustration, um, and I worked for the New York Press, which is oh, the New yeah. York, which is the Alt Weekly here. Yep, it was like the Village Voice competitor, mm-hmm. and I did like the weekly political or editorial type uh, illustration stuff for that paper. And then oh, awesome. they would, I would do a painting or something, and then other Alt Weeklies around the country would pick it up, and they would like you know second or third oh, run awesome. type stuff. So it would be like 
um, LA Weekly, Orlando right. Weekly. There was like a Which whole that's series. Huge experience when you're young. Yeah, but it was like those those alt weeklies were huge. Oh yeah, the, at the time they were very influential. Now they're totally shutting down. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's still around, but only it? because it's owned by the Dispatch, by the local okay. paper, who is then owned by like a yeah. you know conglomerate right. of people that are not in publishing. That's but. the thing about publishing and everyone it's it, I think it's surprising that people don't realize publishing only exists because there's some gigantic wealthy person who doesn't mind throwing money down the drain. Oh, 100%. Everyone's like this doesn't make any money. It's like this never made care. any money. It never made money. <laughs> this never made money. Just some some no. rich guy who made a ton of money doing something completely different. And decides for wanted, whatever reason. Wanted the influence to say, I own this newspaper yep. and I want to say this person for president yes. or this person for Senate. 100%. That's the only yes. reason they own it. That's 100% yes. Uh, I still freelance for them, so I should not <laughs> be having fun. this conversation. No. I feel like they're not going to hear it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No. But it's just like, you know, you're not getting any money off of people buying a right. subscription to your little thing. No. Like, that's not how any of it happens. That's not how any of this works yeah but no so um and then one great thing from that job though even though like you're starting out you're making like not but in yeah. my mind i'm like i have health insurance yeah. now i'm making a salary I'm making like thirty five thousand dollars a year you're killing it but at the time you know you're yeah. young and single and it's great yeah um but the other great part of that was they had just been bought out by the dispatch mm-hmm. which kept them alive and uh, literally um <laughs> in that their name is alive <laughs> uh and they <laughs> Um, we're really investing in podcasts. This was like 2005, 2006, okay. 2007. So like they were really investing in um, that early like pot videos, mm-hmm. content, digital Streaming. content. Like they had heard somewhere at a workshop or yeah. like a conference that one of them went to that like podcasts and streaming and digital was like the wave of the future yeah so they made us all have a blog like an individual blog um and they in addition to the work we did and they, they were like go just go experiment and like go do podcasts but they really didn't put a lot of our editor was great um and he was a young guy that was just kind of like go try things like go see what sticks and yeah. what people will watch so i did all these man on the street interviews with uh, like i would go to the ohio state campus with like and, a microphone just uh-huh. like, hey, who, yeah who? i would do like woman on the street like billy on the street kind yeah. of stuff except not as yelly <laughs> not as yelly. and i would just sort of like interview people and joke around with them about like whatever the news of the week was like yeah. oh there's like the ohio state michigan games coming up like let's do some score predictions like what do you think it'll be and you know like yeah just like what word comes to mind when you think of this but uh, those are still on the deep web on YouTube somewhere, by the way, if you want to. I do. Want to catch those. I do want to catch those. But it was like great experience yeah. to get, a, you know, to have like a blank check to just go around and be like, here's all this professional equipment. Yeah. They, you know, they got a green screen. That's awesome. Oh, and I also did a v- very much a rip off of Weekend Update <laughs> that we, uh, I called Fetterline and Friends, um, where I would just do, you know, like satirical TV news. Yeah. So that, in some ways, that was like my first mm-hmm. professional foray into satire writing because i had my own comedy like weekly comedy segment and that would be embedded on the site it would be on the site yeah nice. and they would push it out to their like fledgling social media things like friendster or something whatever was oh, on then friendster. yeah i was on i miss friendster <laughs> i feel like that's going to be the next wave because people are all everybody hates facebook right even though people are addicted to facebook because right. it's like yeah, it's like a phone book for the world and if we could just like port all of our stuff over to friendster <laughs> I you would think be, we're going to go back? Like, I would love it. It's I like a Walking it. Dead reset of yes. the world to Friendster. Yes. I, mean, I think I'm here for that. Friendster, totally fine. Bring my, back the Friendster. My personal theory is that if someone, if another platform could find a good way to do groups, yeah. like the way that Facebook does private groups, then Facebook's gone. Because well, that's the part that I can't let go of. Is like yeah. we have a private group for the Belladonna writers. Right. And that part is extremely useful. But the part where it's like people screaming about their cats and... <laughs> So let's go, let's talk about that because I want to hear about the the um, the the beginnings of the Belladonna started yeah, from Facebook. Groups. It did. So you guys are online, which I kind of hate. Like I hate giving them credit for it, but that's the reality of how it happened. It was digital assembly. You got to meet. It's like yes. a digital meetup group. It's true. So we were all part of the a comedy writing group just for women. Um, that's a Facebook group. And these are these are comedy, and the outlets you guys are trying to all get into at the exact same time is probably. Uh, shouts, shouts right. and murmurs. McSweeney's, McSweeney's, man, National McSweeney's. Lampoon National at Lampoon. the time, uh, the toast was still well, okay. right on the edge of like when the toast stopped publishing. Okay. People are asking about packets for things or like yeah. the onion. How do I get on Reductress? Reductress, Reductress is a big one. A big the one. onion. Um, so a lot of those same. 
I feel like around that time, Funny or Die was lesser uh, publishing articles. Yeah. I I think it happened, but it was very mysterious, like, how that pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. It was more videos. Um, So, yeah, it was, like, everyone trying to figure out how to get on McSweeney. (laughs) They were like, how do we gang up on Chris Monks in such a way... Yes. Get ourselves on there. And Marty Dundix. <laughs> I know. Just like how, what's the way? So it, it was all kind of like insider type. Yeah. Just like support groups. Yeah. I, it, that was a lot of what it was. And what we were noticing is that the women were on all levels, but mostly it's like a lot of emerging women. You're not like, yeah. it's not like Tina Fey being like, guys, listen, yeah. here's here's what you need to do. It's like a lot of people that are all in the same boat. Right. Um, and then a few have been in writer's rooms or this or that. But like for the most part, it's people in our same state and so um occasionally people would be like i want to start something you know there's not enough places for women to submit and get taken seriously yeah. by which they meant not you know mcsweeney's is great shouts is great but there there just aren't a lot of satire outlets period yeah and then there were a lot of places like um like there's college points, humor points in case there's yeah. the robot butt yeah now but uh yeah. at the time it was like i don't know there was just a a phase of where it felt like a lot of the humor was tra- like the funnier dive videos or the college humor mm-hmm. was very like traditionally male humor totally and so if you wanted geared. to do something and also that age was age related it was yes. like male uh 18 yes. year olds it was like, like if you're 23 and a guy and your name is chad like you are yeah. in a great place yeah um so the chads were doing great and everyone else was not doing great and so uh, uh, we also felt really disheartened that women were getting on there and saying, you know what, I'm just not going to do this anymore because it's not going anywhere. And when I do reach out to someone, I'm getting really like negative feedback or no feedback or I just don't hear back or it's yeah. really confusing. And um, they just, there was no pipeline. There's no, there's nothing, yeah. you know? And so um, it wasn't even like, oh, we don't get paid for this or, or that. It was more just like, I want to feel like my work is getting seen and right. that I'm part of a community and this sort of thing. Um, and that I can use my voice and not just stuff my voice into whatever the mm-hmm. show is. Um, and so we were like, uh, Carrie Whitmer posted finally after, you know, reading a lot of this and said, she just said, I, I want to start a website. Like who's in? Mm-hmm. And Caitlin immediately responded and was like, yes, I'll do it. And Fiona responded and said, yes, I'll do it. And then Caitlin messaged me and was like, Car- this girl, Carrie Whitmer in our group is starting a website. Like, do you want in? And I'm like, yes. So, and how did you guys know each other? Uh, we knew each other from Portland. We okay. had lived in Portland, Oregon at the same time. I After moving back to Ohio and doing all the things we just talked about, uh, after I got married, we moved to Portland, Oregon and lived there for seven years. We skipped that part, Brooke. We did. There we was skipped a gap. it. There was a gap. <laughs> you know, looking we'll back, it wasn't editing. linear. Sorry. <laughs> we missed the whole Portland chapter. So Portland was seven years, and then we moved back to Ohio. Anyway, so... Uh, yeah, this I was already back in Ohio by this point. Okay. But Caitlin had been my teacher at Curious Comedy Theater for a, an, like an advanced sketch class mm-hmm. that I took. And I'd been like nine months pregnant. But I remember taking her aside and being like, I'm going to miss the last class because I'm giving birth. <laughs> and I'm like, but... Oh, how annoying. I, I know. I was like, but I, I'm really serious about this and I don't want you to think I'm not serious. So like, I want to <laughs> keep in touch with you. And she was so impressed by the fact that I was like this poor little waddly, you know, woman <laughs> who was like not the classic comedy profile yeah. of someone who's like... You you know, pushing, I was like 33 by that point, you know, and I'm like out to hear pregnant. And I'm like, just to let you know, I'm really serious about yeah. professional comedy writing. And she's like, okay, <laughs> clearly. Um, and so uh, then, you know, when I moved back, she started teaching at Second City. Mm-hmm. And so she messaged me and was like, you need to take this. Like I took the first iteration of her class there, her satire um, series. And then now I now you teach, teach that it. with her, which is exciting. So you guys seem to be um, responsible I mean, for instructing like this whole generation of online comedy writers now. Because I know I get them as submissions yeah. and I see... Yeah, we send the cream of the crop to you. I see all of them also on like shouts. They're mm-hmm. in the New Yorker yeah. and they're in McSweeney's, McSweeney's and they're little maybe old a, lady and little old and lady case and robot bud and, and mad. All. Yeah, you know, mad's There's doing a lot more mad. stuff. Uh, uh, Who ha is doing some things that we've had people in now. So and other things like just live shows or live readings yeah. and things and several books. And- You're making so many people better at writing comedy. That's you so know? nice. Like, they probably... Marty, they, I'm a crier. Don't make me cry They on this knew show. that they wanted to write comedy, but they didn't know exactly how to do it correctly. And then you guys are like, no, 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 just change this a little bit. Well, we saw you know, ourselves these are the in this. Like, this is why we created the Belladonna's, because we we're just like, there's all this latent talent just sitting here. Yeah. And there's nowhere... I mean, there are places to submit it, but I feel like they just need that extra little, like, but do this, you know, or like, but just... 
have the confidence to do right. it and like go ask for what you want. And so um, I tell people to submit to Belladonna because you guys give feedback that's useful. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to <laughs> like, me. People Which, are, that was a people big part of People send stuff, to, and I'm like, I can't, like, I can't <laughs> help you. Be, I can't help you be funnier. I don't. It it takes too much time, and 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 I'm not a comedy instructor. You guys are. Well, it helps that there's four of us. If yeah. it was only one of us, I'd be like, it's bad. Bye. It is. It's too fast. I can't handle it. It's, it's too bad. Many. It's Sorry, not good. Bye. Yeah, it is. But, but, but like you guys can tell people exactly what to change, or they can take a class. Yeah. I recommend your class to uh, all everybody. Thank you. And I'm That's like, awesome. how about this? Go take that. Class. And the second city is great because it offers online classes. So you yeah. don't have to be in your. I mean, obviously, it offers in person classes as well, and intensives and workshops. But like the online piece was for me a revelation to mm-hmm. be like, I can be hooked into this larger thing and feel like I'm really doing something and really learning something from where I'm at mm-hmm. because I was no less serious about it but just life things and family things I'm you know suddenly you're in Columbus and you have a mortgage and a kid and you're yeah. like well that didn't necessarily go on the path that right. it maybe would be ideal for right. comedy and the traditional pipeline but I I realized later how serious I was about it like in a way I've told people like getting pregnant for me was like when people hear their biological clock tick I heard my comedy clock tick. Mm-hmm. And it for me, where as most people would have been like, you know what, I guess I'm just going to have to let that dream die and yeah. just lean hard into this. I was, I'm was, i very excited about being a mom, and I love it, and my daughter's like almost six now. But that said, I also don't want that to be the only thing that I am. I was extra passionate about comedy. I knew I wanted it to be part of my life. And it, it took that amount of like I had started taking classes at Curious Mm -hmm. Comedy Theater my husband finally bought me like a class as a Christmas gift and was like don't be like now I have purchased it so now you have the guilt of like having to do it because it's been pre-purchased which was totally the impetus that I needed that's how I am with people buying me like cooking classes yeah (laughs) now you have to do it so because he knew I wanted to but it was just like afraid Uh of failing like I was afraid of being mediocre and so then you're like well I don't want to like top out and be like oh the thing I'm really passionate about it turns out I can't do (laughs) And so, <laughs> it's almost better to like have it be that, the unrealized yeah. dream where you're like, I could have done it. Like, I could have. <laughs> to know, nope, I'm bad. I'm really bad at this. Well, I kind of did that with music. Like, I was a vocal <laughs> music performance major. I was, I'm a fine singer. Like, and it was like more of an operatic program, which I knew I didn't want to do opera, but it was, that was what was available at yeah. the college. And so I did like kind of the folk circuit, like the coffee house circuit, and while I was doing entertainment reporting in Ohio. And, I was really passionate about music and I always have been also, but like I hit a point where I'm like, this is about as good as I'm going to get at the guitar. Like, you know what I mean? Like I can, I can accompany myself and that's about it. And like, that's fine. I have a bunch of guitars and I can't play them. Right. All same. So I haven't played them in so long. And so it's just one of those things where I was like, hmm, okay. Like I, I could keep digging into this and investing my time in it, but like this isn't really something that I'm ever going to be as good as I yeah. need to be to be where I want to be with it. And I think really, and like, I still enjoy it and mm-hmm. I still enjoy playing, but like instrumentally, I was never going to be at that point where yeah. people are like, I would pay to see that. Um, it was like friend rock, you know, where people come to support you cause they're your friend and you have like decent banter. But then I realized like, Oh, the banter is my favorite part. <laughs> I'm only checking my phone because we're broadcasting this live on Twitter and I was seeing if anybody had questions Oh, amazing. And I'm I was sure just they don't. If we have questions. Oh, there's tons of questions, oh. but we won't get to them right now. <laughs> we so can't no, get There's none questions. No, there's no questions. Um, I wanted to, uh, when you when you want to do comedy and you write in the, in, the, in the manner that you do, you're so funny. I think the first thing I read you. that you um, that I ever got to publish of yours was the, was the Disney, the, the animatronic Disney, Disney thing. thing. And that is so funny. Oh, thank you. And I'm sure you're going to send me more things eventually. Well, you gonna... published something with me and Eric Sternberger last yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. It's Number two. It counts. I mean, it's ish. It's like one third of well, a Well, he reached out to me. And was like, yeah, I know. Well, look, I had a book coming out. <laughs> he reached out to me and was like, I have an idea. Like, do you want to throw in on this? And I was like, I, I have absolutely no time and I'm in. Yes. Because no, he lives in a, Columbus as well. It's a very funny piece. Thank you. But it, I, it was I agree. We were both just like, okay, let's ex- just get it out. It was an expose. Yeah. It was very good. <laughs> an it, expose. It, uh, it drilled down into some of the horrible elected officials' past, which are horrible. I mean, these guys are awful. just trash. They're trash um, people. But, uh, yeah, so the first one I really spent people. more time with and I enjoyed. But the style um, of your writing, who 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 do you like? 
who do you read that um, that writes in the manner? Because I really, really love uh, Steve Martin's writing. Oh, I yeah. I love his older stuff that he mm-hmm. did for the New Yorker and for New York Magazine, mm-hmm. and he did a whole uh, collection called Pure Drivel mm-hmm. that was published. And I constantly give that book to people whenever they talk about like comedy or if they're interested in comedy. I'm like, just read this book, mm-hmm. and if you can be this, mm-hmm. you will be successful. Well, the hard part is like too. <laughs> He's so funny. There are people that I can say like I I'm really influenced by or. Or uh, really matter to me, but I'm not sure that my writing is even in the same vein as theirs necessarily. Yeah. It's more just like, oh, I wish it was. Yeah. But then when you write it, it becomes its own thing. Right. You know? Like Steal Like an Artist, like Austin Kleon's yeah. book. I really believe in that. So at any rate, um, like it becomes your own thing. Even if you tried to make a Beatles album, you couldn't because right. you're not the Beatles. So right. It's going to like take on your own But you're going to make something. You're, you're going to make something. It's your interpretation exactly. of an idea. So at any rate, like I really love Jack Handy and his stuff on Jack SNL. Jack Handy. That was one of the, the, the biggest thrills that uh, I got was reaching out to Jack Candy and he wrote me one piece. Amazing. It took me a year and a half That's to awesome. get him. I got his email from somebody else who said, don't tell him how you got this contact info. And you I gotta said, love that. I said, okay. I and I reached out and I got him and I was like, hey, I'd really love if you could write. And he was like, what's this about? And, and then... Um, it just happened that uh, Bob Eckstein did the illustration to accompany the article, so it Incredible. made it into this perfect thing. So Incredible. It, it like turned into a great That's package. So much street cred. That's it did, amazing. and then it let them kind of uh, they became uh, connected, and then they worked on a project together separately. Cut me out completely. That's fine. That's fine. But it was Whatever. so thrilling to get a piece by Jack Candy. Because, so I mean, cool. I had all the Deep Thoughts books. He's just oh, yeah. so absurd. I had them so all funny. growing up. And, like, uh, Ted L. Nancy, whoever that actually was. Uh, yes. Letters from a Nut. I actually did the book jacket for um, when uh, he, we actually had a book imprint at Lampoon years and years earlier. And there was a book called Hello Junk Mail by Ted L. Nancy. Mm-hmm. And I got to do all the book design for it. So Amazing. I was emailing him back and I forth. I think I have that book. And, and he's, he's in it. he is a nut. Amazing. He is an absolute crazy But yeah, person, that but sort of funny. like absurdist tinge yes, on that things that are like stuff. folksy mixed with like crazy absurdist. Uh, yeah. Or like... Stuff um, that takes a turn, but like yes. in a in a, such a nonchalant way, yes. you never saw it coming and they still don't acknowledge that it was a turn. But there's some you know? joy in it. And I think that's why I love satire writing is like I am... I really deeply identify with like Amy Poehler mm-hmm. and that it, she just brings a lot of joy and community to it. And I feel like... Having worked on, like, I've done marketing for comedy theaters and I've done, you know, that sort of thing. I've seen, like, the stand-up world and the improv world. And they're all interesting and great and have great people in them. But there's, like, a segment of comedy that's, like, sort of just attracts, like, deeply broken people, yeah. you know? And that was never my favorite part where it's, like, just no. a bunch of people being like, oh, this, uh, you know, like, our lives suck. Yeah. And we hate everything. Everyone's very depressed. Yeah. And all the jokes are around how they, uh, how depressed are you? Oh, I'm, I'm more depressed than you. Oh, yeah. you, you and to, like, I never out, really bought that that's, sad. Like, Yes, Somebody. you have to outsad someone or outshock them. Yeah. And those, that's not my brand of comedy. Yeah. Like, to me, I was, I think that's really a reductive view of comedy. And so, to me, it was about, like, the joy of sharing this laughter where, like, even if you have very different backgrounds, you're like, oh, yeah, like, that's, that we relate to that on yeah. some level. And that's really funny. So, I don't buy into the theory that, like, comedy comes from your brokenness yeah. necessarily. I think it can, you know, like there's it definitely can. people that yeah. I find funny that do that, but there's also people that seem like John Mulaney. <laughs> it seems like I love John incredibly Mulaney. well adjusted, yeah. but also incredibly funny just because of the way he sees the world. Um, so like, obviously like the Tina and Amy yeah. people of the world, um, Mike Sachs. Was Mike like a, Sachs. He, he blurbed our book. He lives up the street from Kaylin and I. He's in Park Slope. He's been like a, a satire hero of mine. So when he wrote back and was like, oh, I love this book. I was like, oh, cool. He's such a, cool, he's cool, such cool, a nice cool, guy. Cool, cool. He's such a nice guy. And I think maybe it's funny because I met him through just mutual friends. Mm-hmm. And I just met him socially. And we just hung out at a bar together. Oh, nice. And I just knew him as a guy who's a neighbor of mine. And then we hung out and we did like happy hour or whatever. And I connected with him with other people. And we just like, it was just more of a social thing. And then like later on, as I'm not seeing him as often, he is like, the comedy, everyone, he's like the comedy authority. And I'm like, oh, like I, I, just, I just thought you were this guy I met up the street. <laughs> Has he written for you? Yeah, one thing. Oh, amazing. One thing. Amazing. It's very funny. Yeah, well, he's he and, is very N- funny. It's called NPR Fan Fiction, and it's really, really That's funny. incredible. Yeah. I wrote a piece for Second City that got in a um, like a festival that they were doing for women, and it was an NPR pledge drive, but done as like a morning, by a morning show crew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was really fun to do, to like combine those worlds. I really love the NPR world. Yeah. And it's ripe for, for satire, even oh, though I love so it. Oh, they're so funny. We did a thing, uh, Janine Annette. I don't know if you know her. I love her. I mean, she I, she's like something. an internet 
friend and not a real life friend. This, yeah, this team of people, they're all this... I mean, I know them as writers that write, and then I know that they have these these splinter off to these mm-hmm. little private groups. Um, but she wrote something called Wake Up America mm-hmm. recently, and it was so good because it's so like a morning show, mm-hmm. but it's also, it's Wake Up America. You're right. all stupid, and everyone's uh, dying in these horrible mass shootings. And the whole thing was just, and it, it's, it's exactly how the news reports these things, and it's always thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Mm-hmm. And then they go, our next story is this dog <laughs> who can dance. And they're like, oh my good God, segue. that's adorable. That's amazing. But now we don't like, feel pain. And now it's like, but it was like eight segues in a row, and it was just so that's blunt. Awesome. She's great. really smart. Yeah. And she's another example example of someone that I, I don't think she lives in New York or LA. She's a mom, I think. Mm-hmm. And she like is a little bit older than the standard 23 year old Chad. And so I really, I feel love like a to lot of the comedy like writers that. that you guys have produced through the second city classes and the Belladonna's are these, uh, atypical comedy writers who are, uh, maybe later in life, maybe, uh, have had a completely different career. Yeah. Maybe they have but I think families that informs in a way. Their comedy yes. writing and this, amazing way where you're getting a different perspective totally. and you're getting somebody that's actually lived some life so has something right. to say about it. Yeah. Like, not that, you know, sorry, 23-year-old Chads. I think you can be very funny. But no, I think, they have like, no voice. But they, they have don't no have idea. a voice yet. Like, they haven't lived anything. Their parents paid for their college yeah. to go to Harvard and then they're yeah. like, well, I'm ready to write comedy. Exactly. And I'm like, you haven't lived through anything. Yeah, nothing horrible has happened to you no. yet. <laughs> and I also think, like, living in Ohio is I used to see it, like, when I was first starting out, I feel like I apologized for it a lot. Like, it mm-hmm. was definitely something where I'm like, okay, so I'm not New York or LA. Or I would just say, like, I'm Midwest-based. Yeah. So, like, maybe they think it's Chicago. Yeah. But now it's like, I see that it's such an asset because I'm like, I am in the heartland of all the things that are happening nationally. And I am right, you know, like, my street for the elections was, like, half Democratic signs and yeah. half Republican signs. And I'm like, that's so interesting to me yeah. that your neighbors who you're all out like chit-chatting with, they're like side-eyeing each other like, oh, what are you? Okay, interesting. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I'm right at that point where it's a lot of the conversations that we're having are manifesting itself in my mm-hmm. life and in my community in this really real way that I think is interesting to observe up close and good mm-hmm. for my comedy and gives me a different voice than you know other people yeah and so to me that helps me establish a voice and a sensibility um and i like living you know i live a block from the park and i don't get stabbed and it's amazing (laughs) hey not getting stabbed very uh i think not getting stabbed is so underrated (laughs) um but yeah i love i love where i live and i i like to come you know i'd like to come here more often and like well, you Have will, it. since you're a big-time author now. I mean, since I'm famous now. So let's talk about the book, because you guys wrote uh, an article that luckily went in McSweeney's. Yeah, so well, and... first we pitched it to The New Yorker, but we pitched it as slightly different. Um, wow. We pitched wow. it as, uh, I think it was something like porn for the liberal woman. Okay. And probably, first of all, it's amazing that Emma Eschalt even received it, because I'm sure it went in her spam filter yeah. <laughs> for that reason. Red um, flag, red yeah, flag. maybe don't pitch something with porn in the title. Yeah. And then, so she very lovingly rejected it and said, um, this is, you know has some good stuff, but not for me. And then uh, we were like, well, let's, we don't want it to go on our site, because yeah. we have done that, and we want it to be, that we're, we're growing the site, so we want traffic and eyes on us. Yeah. Um, and so we were like, Chris has been so supportive, Um Chris Monks, the editor of McSweeney's, has been so supportive of us just starting this new thing. And I think mm-hmm. he's been very supportive to women's voices in general Yeah, on, on McSweeney's. And um, it's it's only that he publishes, you know, it's just him. So it's like five or six or eight articles a week. So yeah. that's, I think what he's doing is great and he gives great constructive feedback. But if you're not in those articles or if you're not breaking into that you know we just wanted there to be more so in no way was our starting the belladonna any comment negatively on what he or other people yeah there's only there's only so many things people can publish yeah there's just only so much bandwidth to publish things so we just wanted there to be more so at any rate he'd been very very supportive from the beginning and so we reached out to him and he's like yes i love it he ran the piece basically without edits i think and it was like a few weeks we wrote it in january it came out in early february and you know, usually you write a piece and it gets like anywhere between one and one. a thousand shares, right? Yeah. I mean, or like if you get two thousand shares, oh, you're yeah, like, oh huge. my gosh, that's, yeah, that is, like that's look at me. Yeah, um, I think like the top piece that I had ever written got fifteen thousand shares on the Second City Network, and that was around the 
it was like a piece um, of Ohio when they did the um, the con- Republican National Convention, mm-hmm. like basically writing a Dear John letter to Trump and mm-hmm. being like, no, this is, we, we don't want to be associated with your whole right. thing. So that like tapped into an anger that people were having or whatever. So um, that got like 15,000 shares and I was like, well, goodbye world. I'm going right. to go. <laughs> yeah, that was like the apex of my career. So that that was just for comparison. Right. That's kind of where we had all been. And then... Um, we wrote this piece, and within hours, like a day, it got shared like 110,000 times on Facebook. Wow. And we were getting all these internet comments. Yeah. They don't track Twitter shares, so I don't know. But uh, at any rate, just obviously something had mm-hmm. hit a nerve. And it, it was around the time of the Me Too conversation really hitting the yeah. its stride. And we just hit the right thing at the right moment yeah, but i don't think we had i think we had a sense that we really loved the piece yeah. and so w- we wanted it to do well in that sense because we were just like oh this one really feels like in our voice and we really love it but i don't think we were like sitting by the computer being like we are welcome world <laughs> like yeah. it's gonna just blow up like we didn't have any expectations and it was a that. pretty it's it, uh it's not a long piece no it's it's very concise it's got uh, i think in the original article it had the uh 12 vignettes the, uh, like tom hardy with the uh lacroix yep I always want to call it lacrosse. That was the genesis of this whole yeah. thing was us having a G-chat. We have like an epic G-chat just all day long, all the time to talk about Belladonna things mm-hmm. and other, you know, obviously we just talk about the world. And we were joking about, you know, we're always talking about monetizing the site and how we're going to do that as a young site, trying to figure out, a, you know, it's hard in comedy to figure out a sustainable way, as you know well. Yeah, there, there isn't one. There I got, isn't I, one. I got right. news for you. It's not. <laughs> right. So we have these endless conversations where we back ourselves into corners. And I, so as a joke, we're always saying like, I think what we should do is just have LaCroix sponsor us because we drink so much of it. And, and I'm like, so that should probably solve it. And I'm like, yeah. you know. Just for the first year or two, they can just kind of be our benefactor. And I'm like, so I was like, to be clear, I don't know how sponsorships work. <laughs> and I was like, so I'm just suggesting, I was like, in my mind, they just bring a, like Tom Hardy brings you LaCroix. Yeah. And that's it. That's and it. that's a sponsorship. And I'm like, is that not it? And Fiona, I think, was like, uh, that sounds like porn for Brooklyn women. And I was like, oh, there you go. And she goes, that's our monetization idea. We'll write like Tom Hardy LaCroix porn and they'll send us envelopes of cash. Yeah. And we were just, I mean, as a joke, we were yeah. like just laughing about it. And then uh, Caitlin goes, that's a piece. That's really funny. And she opens a Google Doc. We all start throwing things into it. We wrote the, um, he takes me into his office and shuts the door to promote me. He promotes me again and again. I'm wild with ecstasy. Just not even as part of the piece, just yeah. we're making each other laugh on Gchat. And then we had two or three like that and she was like, okay, we're doing this. We're writing, we're a group writing a piece. We wrote it in like a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and would have written it faster, but we're all we have day jobs yeah. that we have to like go to and from. But we were all really excited about the concept because it felt really replicable. Yeah. But it also felt not exactly like something we had seen mm-hmm. in that voice before. And so we were like, oh yeah, we have to submit this somewhere. So it gets shared a bajillion thousands of times. Yes. And then how quickly did a publisher say, Hey, I want this? About five days. So, That's amazing. I know. So this has been around so that was like this February. This has been the craziest year. So it comes out. We all like high five a million angels because it did well. Mm-hmm. And then we're just about to like go back to our day, daily lives to be like, that was neat. Yeah. We really succeeded in our goal to like, we had great traffic that week, you know. Mm-hmm. So we're like, we did it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> the end. And then we got our. Uh, hi. I definitely <laughs> didn't spill coffee, so don't worry about it. Um, so, so then we uh, got an email. From this woman who was like, hi, I work at this. I, I don't want to give like specifics because that's I feel fine. like I don't want people to email this poor right. woman and be like, I have a book. She's like, that's not. They're like, I right. have porn. <laughs> that's right. I got porn. You want my porn? You want my Bigfoot porn? Exactly. Exactly. So, but at any, it's easily Googleable. But at any rate, uh, so she reached out to us and was like, uh, she had just come over from another label. So she was kind of looking to fill her dance card, I mm-hmm. surmise. She didn't say that. And and she was sort of like, um, I'm the executive editor here. I just read your piece. I'm laughing my ass off. I just sent it all over my office, which her office is Hachette. <laughs> like, it's yeah. not like her office, which is an accounting firm with four people. Right. It's like Hachette UK, you know. So she's like... Um, so yeah, we love it. My coworkers love it. Have you ever, have you ever thought about turning this into a book? <laughs> we're like, have I? It's like, it's been four yeah. days. <laughs> we were like, that's literally all we've thought about <laughs> since we've been eight is how do we turn anything that we've ever thought or written into a book, a comedy book. And we're like, 
Yes. So we write back. So first we Google her to make sure she's a real person <laughs> and that it's not like a highly literate phishing scam. <laughs> It's like a pyramid scheme. Yeah, we were like, we want to publish your book. You just have but to it just pay us. Happen. I mean, I, yeah. it just doesn't happen. So you just feel like you have to do your due diligence. So we reached out and we're like, yes, amazing. But like, we didn't really have our hopes too up because it seemed like, well, maybe she sends like 50 of those and then it drops off and you yeah. never hear from them again or whatever. And so we were like, yes, amazing. Like, we'd love to chat with you about it anytime or we could put a proposal together or how does this work kind of thing. And then she wrote back. You know, within, you know, we kind of went some back and forth Mm -hmm. over email for the next couple of days. And then she made us an offer. Boom. (laughs) No proposal. That's awesome. It doesn't happen. No. Ever. And before anyone that is listening gets um, very, very jealous, please know that we had had all of the traditional no's and experiences through up until that point yeah. so this isn't like i just got into comedy one day and just got yeah. i just didn't have to work for it at all like we've been rejected so many times so but those stories are sad yeah those stories are sad <laughs> we don't want to tell them yeah but i mean I, it is important to know that uh, somebody on twitter had uh like a hashtag or something a discussion where it was sort of like talk about your like how your rejection shaped you. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, or like what was your first McSweeney's piece or how many times were you rejected by McSweeney's? And I said, I was rejected 14 times before I got a yes. But then my second yes, I got a book deal from. (laughs) (laughs) So like keep going, you know, and that piece was rejected by somebody else. So if we'd just been like, oh, maybe it doesn't have legs, you know, then we wouldn't have this. So. Well, I would have published it. Thanks. Um, Do you publish books? Do we do it? Humorist Books launched it uh, in August. Amazing. Humoristbooks.com. Good to know. Good plug. Good segue. <laughs> um, so at any rate, so that happened. And then through that, we got an agent. Like, we were we were the saddest people. We were like, so, um, so sorry to be these people. How do we do this? Like, how do we get an agent to negotiate yeah. this contract for yeah. us? And she was so utterly fair with us and was like, go tell them you have an offer on the table yeah, and you'll be surprised like that people really, might want to work with you. It's like if you don't have any sort of an offer and you have a book, nobody no wants, to wants to represent you. No one wants to work you. with you. And then like, the second once you have you've an already offer on the table, sold everything yeah. and they have to do literally nothing yeah, but take 10% like, or whatever, yes, they love that. They love it. So sure enough, people were like, we would love to work with you. And we're like, amazing. <laughs> so it was a good week. Um, and then, so we got an, I mean, we interviewed like three or four Do, agents in What's your days. literary agent? Uh, David Black Agency. It's Is that like Susan a, all Rainoffer. literary? Yeah. Yeah. And are you represented as as a single group? Uh, yeah, we're just like represented together. As, as a, a Belladonna group? Uh, not as the Belladonna because we keep it. It's not yeah. a Belladonna book per se, even though we're the four editors But you of four it. are represented together. Yeah. So you don't all have separate agents who are fighting with each other. Exactly. That's that's good. That's very important. <laughs> and we we all get along really, really yeah. well. We just ha- And that is an important facet of this is like finding your tribe or your Mm -hmm. people that like, I think each one of those women are like comedy Queens who are so hardworking and so talented. And I'm so lucky to like partner with them. But the second we came together and we're like, we're really going to like put our full collective force into this and Mm -hmm. trust each other. It's hard to trust each other's comedy work and to, to trust that we can make it better. Um, together than it would be individually like big things started happening for us that would not have happened I firmly believe individually right. not to say any of us wouldn't have had any success individually I'm sure that we would have but I think we have accomplished much more together by just clicking in and finding that group yeah. that that flow that like worked for us mm-hmm. and for some people that might be alone and for some people that could be two people or four you know for us it was yeah. four it takes four of us to write a book but we did it um, but you know that has just everything started to open up when we found our people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was, and then we, our agent helped us get like a mini proposal together, which is still like 80 pages. So a mini proposal to shop like a parallel US deal for the same book on the same timeline. And so we met with publishers and everything that So exciting. Yeah, it's crazy. So then going from the the written article, which is not that long, Mm -mm. and then you scaled it. To yeah. a book. Yeah. So you had how many vignettes in the article? Twelve. And then how many are in the book? Uh, I don't know exactly off the top of my head. Somewhere in the 70s, I think. So that's a lot more. Yeah. So you broke it up into categories? like mm-hmm. uh, Yeah, so topics? we decided that would be, and I think it was at the behest of one of our editors, which was a great idea. It was mm-hmm. like, instead of just randomly coming up with as many as you can, why don't we be like four you have some literary ones. You have some, you know, political ones. What are the yeah. categories like? Political, uh, holiday, There family. is... Uh, do you have a book with you? God, do I? I don't know. I think I may have given it away. Oh. I have postcards, but they don't have the, 
uh, it's like new erotica for uh for literature is one like li- okay. women from literature uh historical is another Ooh, one historical is a good one we have a great one about eleanor roosevelt uh that's amazing like where it's like a remake of her my day columns yeah. Um, and we have, uh, for parents, uh-huh. which that was the trickiest one because it was important to us because we feel like that group of feminists is not very seen yeah. in the world, but, um, and they have really unique feminist challenges, but you don't want to eroticize children in any way or risk, you know, like, <laughs> you like just the mere like combination of those Venn diagrams <laughs> is like such a dangerous Keep thing. Keep very apart. Like yeah. you have to find a way to like make it, like, yeah. to be clear, we're... We're not pedos. Right. Yeah. So um, that was, that took the longest to like figure out exactly the right entry point for that. But yeah. Um, so yeah, parents is one. Pop culture mm-hmm. is one that was very easy to write. Like we had to trim those down because you could write an endless amount of those. So that means there could be more of these books. We you have hope enough... if there's demand and the first book sells well, we would love to write another Which one. Which it will, obviously. I mean, I, I, as well as it already has. From what I've seen online, all these places are sold out. Well. Right. In theory. So they're going to be putting up more? I, I saw also, a thing. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, it depends on how many they got, you know, the first time. But, yeah, they're going to restock them. And yeah. it seems to be doing well. We're excited. It's only the second day that it's been available. We're excited. I will say this. Having the Belladonna as a group, even though this isn't an official Belladonna book. And yeah. the, one of the reasons we didn't want to do that is because it's just us. Yeah. And we see the Belladonna is not just us. Right. We are the founders of it, but it's this community of right. people. So if we do a Belladonna book, which I would be totally open to and would yeah. love to do in the future, that's a lot more complicated of figuring out how do you pay everyone in the right way. You know, yeah. like how do you make everyone feel represented and right. what's the process and all of that. Um, so if we were ever asked to do that or had an opportunity to, I would love to, but we didn't want it to seem like, well, yeah. why? <laughs> Thanks a lot for taking all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like way to go. But we wanted to instead use this as an opportunity, like in all of our press um, opportunities or events, like we're really going to be shouting out that community yeah. and trying to like bring attention because they're doing amazing work. Yeah. And there are some really incredible people from getting their first byline ever to people that write on like, you know, the Samantha B show or yeah. um, uh, Sasha Stewart wrote for Larry Wilmore mm-hmm. when it was on. So like we've had some authors and, you know, some bigger people, but uh, I like that it's like all levels, and we really want to use this to elevate those, those voices. It's fun getting those writers because in the, it, I'm finding a lot of people who have maybe day jobs writing mm-hmm. at other places don't get the outlet to write short little pieces. Uh, yes, that is true. You know? Yeah, I think they don't, re- or they want to, you yeah. know, or maybe they're not fully in the writer's room and they're just getting to submit sometimes, yeah. like they're doing social media or something like that. So we're really interested in how we can expand those pipelines like traditional pipelines for women yeah i think we're still really young in our own you know uh in our own publication so we're just sort of finding our voice in that and our advocacy in that but that's really important to us is to start to have the conversation of like okay great we we're building this thing together it seems to be working we have this great internal community where we're sharing opportunities and people are getting stronger and giving each other feedback and sharing packets and opportunities but then like where does this go from there you know how can we continue to widen the pathway to actually go to some paid opportunities to go to some careers um and you know just to figure out how to make this as impactful as we possibly can well you're building a new brand is is overall what you're doing and i think that it's it's fun i mean there's uh there's reductorist Mm -hmm. uh, and and they're sort of female skewed satire they are i mean they're it's just more of, i feel like you guys took yours in a completely different direction where it's more we satire. intentionally did that because we didn't want to step on their toes yeah. we've several of us have written you know contributed to them before yeah. but they're a parody of a women's magazine so like exactly. a cosmo so it's kind of fake news articles ish mm-hmm. in, in that kind of construct. i've heard it called the feminist onion i don't know yes. if they would call it that but that's sort of that's in why the they're voice. yeah that's how i but see there, them being so there is different. a very much a uniform voice that they want to achieve because it's that magazine yeah. voice which right. is can be wildly funny but we our intent was to create a, a site for women that was um designed to not have one corporate voice right. but to elevate individual voices to where people felt comfortable not having to like just write in one style but to explore That's exactly their own what i like to do their so own voice i felt like the or i feel like sometimes mcsweeney's falls into that 
with mm-hmm. the onion. And I feel like they have a tone that they very much uh, sure. stick to, and they do very good at sticking to that tone. People yeah. absolutely love it. Yeah. And then a lot of people don't write that way, though. Right. And I feel like it's a, it's a good place it, on Weekly Humorous and on Belladonna's and on, on Poison Case and, and Robot Bud and, and in The New Yorker. Right. There's a variety of voices mm-hmm. that are different. Yeah. And, um, and I, I enjoy that because I feel like people can kind of – there's like a – it's like a smorgasbord of, of, uh, of, of comedy and you can get something that maybe someone – you know, it isn't into, but you have enough that everyone kind of gets something good out of the side. Well, and for women, yes. And for women, you know, like if you've been in stand up as a woman, they will almost always tell you like, oh, we already have a woman on this bill. Yeah. And so like as if you as couldn't if be a different jokes. kind exactly. of funny, like, yeah. oh, well, sorry, someone's already telling your jokes. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> we don't huh. need any, we don't need any more period jokes. That's right. You're like what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's all we can joke about. And it, that's it, how people to think. be clear, if that's that's a valid thing for satire yeah. also that we welcome. But it's not the only thing that women talk about, you know, so yes. it's like the or, or in different voices, you know, right. you could do similar material in different from different angles. So for us, um, it was really important to be like, there's this absurdist piece or there's really highbrow stuff or really biting political yeah. or social satire or just silly right. light things that are really fun. Sometimes we ask specifically in our newsletter could just send us like light fun things to because it's yeah. 2018 and yeah. everyone's tired less news we're topical tired stuff. this month like send us funny like light things about evergreen cats. normal yes. yes and those are we've had some really amazing things like that go yeah big on our site just from people like it yeah they fun. like it it's everyone like a, likes to laugh it's right escapism now. honestly i think that's part of why our book has enjoyed any level of success is like these are weighty there's weighty issues yeah. uh, underlying it underpinning it and i'm glad that they're a part of it you know mm-hmm. we definitely wanted to talk about emotional labor and talk about these um like the me too movement and things that we really care about but those conversations do drain you even though they're important to have yeah. and so to us this was like the steam release valve of yes. that of just like we still want to talk about it this is still a part of who we are but we need to laugh. Yeah. Like we're really sad because it's of all the things that have happened. And um, so, and it was also very serendipitous that the midterms went the way they did. I think yeah. that was helpful, but yeah, so it's, it's good to just also have that lighter side and be able to approach it from a, yeah. a joyful place too. I think that's fun. Also, uh, the, maybe the way the uh, internet is anonymous and maybe, and maybe, uh, female writers have noticed i i don't notice gender when i get the emails necessarily mm-hmm. at all i just read the content so i think if maybe everyone was like you marty the world would be a better i don't know place. i don't know if i'm doing it on purpose maybe i'm just lazy but i'm just like i'm like <laughs> reading the content i'm like hey, yeah it's fine yeah that's, hey, good. that's good. good yeah yeah flag like that for later yeah and then it's not you know you, you see that it's a, a girl or, or a boy and maybe you don't know if it's a girl or a boy based on the name because there's lots of gender right. uh neutral names right um but i mean i think i think that's also been something that it's like you you can on the internet the the cream rises to the top because uh, you can kind it's of more egalitarian yeah, yeah. In yeah. theory, at least, you hope. In yeah. theory, it seems to be uh, helping. How about that news story about how there weren't enough pitch packets for late night because there weren't enough contenders? I saw that. I was just like, we what? Did see that. <laughs> yeah, I don't buy into that theory, obviously. Yeah, we, there's so many people. Well, that's part. that goes back to the conversation of widen, widening the pipeline yeah. of like comedy writing and women in comedy writing are like an iceberg. Like you're seeing this little piece sticking out, Mm -hmm. but there's all this below the surface. There's all this talent just sitting there waiting to come to the surface. And if you're not in UCB, if you're not in these places and you're not able to, or you don't feel safe there because they've had some issues as well with um, things. And, uh, I'm not making a comment on that one where I haven't really been a part of that scene, so I can't make a comment about it, but I would say like, women don't always feel welcome or safe in, in any space for, you know, some reason. So it's their prerogative. So at any rate, I think like making it, um, wider to be like, Hey, there's all these great voices that clearly have something to say Mm -hmm. in this moment. Like, I think the reason women are enjoying a lot more success in the satire world is they have a lot to say right now. There's a lot of, there's a lot of anger coming forward of women being like, you know what, actually this is not okay. And this is not right. And I have, all these pent up thoughts about this yeah. and that's making for great comedy like yeah. great art sort of arises in time of 
Not that all satire is great art, but you know what I mean? It can be. Can be. I think yeah, the, like, be. the really perfect satire articles that are topical are the kind that are, they're really funny, but they also educate you mm-hmm. in something. You know, it, right. it makes you laugh. It also makes you think. Yes. Because it shows the hypocrisy and it shows how ridiculous something is. We have found, I have found personally that any time a piece has done well for me, and this, I'm not saying this is necessarily true 100% of the time across the board for everyone, but for me, the pieces that always have the most success um, being shared and mm-hmm. re- responded to in a public way are because they're at the intersection of like funny, but anger. Um, mm-hmm. And people reaching out and being like that, it gave them that extra like, yeah, you know what? That's not right. I'm going to share that. Yeah. Um, the lighter pieces are great, and they can do well too. But it's usually for me, it's been that moment of someone being like, oh, I feel that way too, and that's why they click the share button. It's not necessarily because I, I hope it's because they laughed. Yeah. But I don't think it's just because they laughed. Courtney, I think they uh, Courtney with Kokak. It. Um, she's a. I love her. I got to meet her. I was in Los Angeles uh, two weeks ago, she's and I got best. to meet her, and she's delightful. She writes for Danger and Eggs um, on uh, Amazon. On Amazon. She's very funny. She's and, extremely uh, funny and smart. She wrote uh, something for me around the uh, Kavanaugh hearings, and it was so, it was like an anger, it was a rage satire piece mm-hmm. where she had channeled her anger into something that was incredibly constructive. Yep. It wasn't just shouting on the internet. It was it was doing something very creative and funny and poignant, and it was like, it was showing the ridiculousness of someone saying um, not to believe uh, 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 women, mm-hmm. and it was, it was, it was perfect. It was like, yeah, I'm going to do this because... She's really great. You and know. It, that's why I love satire in general is because it is it is a harder form, I think, and I'm biased, but I, I think satire is a harder form but a, a higher, like a greater form of comedy because you have these raw emotions that you have to harness and turn into something, mm-hmm. and t- you know, to try to point out a vice in society, to try to have a singular angle where they can see through your sarcasm or your, uh, you know, your uh, hyperbole and see what you're really trying to say you're really trying to bring justice in some way. You know, mm-hmm. I think it attracts people that have a strong, like, justice yeah. antenna. Yeah. Where they want to a... make things right. Yeah. And I try to be a receptive uh, e- editor when someone sends a piece like that where it's like, you can tell that that they have that going on and they have this sort of constructive rage where it's going to actually inform someone. And, and you feel, as the editor, you want to get this up as right? soon as possible, you know, I'm like, it, it becomes like my mission to publish their piece because of this uh, this amazing message that they have for the world. And you're like, yes, I'm, I'm going to be part of this. And you're like, you, you try to write back, ASAP, going up, and you yeah. have to rush to your office, of and you course. have to get it up, and then you want to, you know, you, you feel good posting it because you're sharing their, posting, their words. There's no greater crack in the world than writing a piece and having that instant gratification of like a timely piece where it goes up that same day yeah. or like the next day. Oh, that's good. It's I try rare to get, when I get up happen. in like the next hour when people jump on it's something ama- really good. That, but that's rare. I drop everything and I'm like, I have to make art for this immediately. <laughs> yes, exactly. Not only does that mean the writer has to be able to cogently distill their rage into a constructive funny idea yeah. quickly which is hard to do but it means they have to find the right outlet for it and that editor has to be willing to throw i mean there's a lot of things that have to like fall in place the yeah. right way so it doesn't happen that much but when it happens it's so good yeah i'll be on like the subway and they we kind of have subway uh sometimes subway signals uh, for the for the cell phones and I'll, I'll get something on like on like one stop it, it's like every stop you get wi-fi and then in between the steps, mm-hmm. you can know why. Okay? I so that today. I'll like get an email in one stop, and then I read it. And I'm like, oh, then I have to like write them back. And I'm like, I'm posting this right when I get off the subway. Well, the pace of news now is so fast that Ugh. like by the time you get to the next stop, you're like, ah, oh, no, never mind. It's already That's, old. Sorry, we're not talking about that anymore. <laughs> We've like, moved not on. really, but kind of. The news cycle is already over for that piece. Sorry. Well, we'll get pieces like three or four days later, and it's. That's I'm sure way. that in their mind, they're. Like thinking, oh, I'm still thinking about this and talking yeah. about this. And it's like by the time we would get it up and people would read it, it's out of the news cycle, which is crazy. That's a crazy fast news cycle. And it's, it's become a classic piece by then. Yeah. <laughs> I brought up I brought up your article from McSweeney's. Can you read any vignette that you like from the book? Sure. Yeah. Like, now, from, now, these are any from the McSweeney's in the book? They're all in the book. Okay. So they are in the book. Well, you pick out one and then you get to read one. And then mm. that can be your awkward story for talk word. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is one that has gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of likes. Like, people really enjoy this. Uh, okay. It's, I get catcalled on the street by a construction worker. 
He says that he can see I'm smart because I have enormous books. He tells me he's reading the latest Zadie Smith novel. I invite him to join my book club and spend all night fantasizing about his insightful commentary around nonlinear plot structure. <laughs> uh, you ladies are so smart. Oh, thank you. You knew all kinds of big words. We, <laughs> we had to look them all up. I did. <laughs> we were like synonyms for good. And um, that's why I like being in uh, uh, Caitlin's book club. I'm in uh, your co-author's book club. She's amazing. And the whole group is amazing. She's incredibly well read. Everybody, Her whole apartment is like all, all the books. books you wish you had time to yeah. read and were reading. I have many books in my apartment and I've read maybe 1% of and them. And I don't know when she reads them. She reads constantly, but she's the most driven person. You yeah. know, she's always comedy writing, she's teaching, she's writing this book. Yeah. And yet, she makes time for every everything. It really makes me look bad because I try to use that as my example for why I haven't read things. And she's like, "Oh yeah, I read that, and then this, and then that other thing." And the book club is so organized, uh, where we'll meet and then we'll talk about all these things, and then the next day she'll send this detailed email with links to everything we we talked mm-hmm. about, things where we can read more about a topic. It's so good. It's so wonderful. She is a lovely, uh, <laughs> like administrator, administrator in the highest sense, yeah. not a you know not an executive assistant sense, but like she is just has that mind to be like, how do we organize this? How do we move it forward? She just keeps us all moving forward. Yeah. Like she's a lot of the reason that the Belladonna works as well as it does. Everyone, like each one of us, plays a different, yeah. a different equal part. But she is just so driven that she won't let things fall off the plate. She's not the person that's yeah. like, oh, I wish we had done this, right? She makes it happen. It's good to have people like that around you. They, oh, like, she's just a kind dynamo. Of, they just drive everything forward. New erotica for feminists, satirical fantasies of love, lust, and equal pay is in bookstores now. Go pick it up. And you guys are doing a huge book tour uh, of events, I know, and specifically in New York. So people are listening yeah. in New York. Um, you have stuff tonight, tomorrow, and Friday. Tonight, uh, Fiona Taylor is going to be reading at Susan Shapiro's uh, book event in Brooklyn at the Barnes & Noble. Uh, in Park Slope. In Park Slope on 7th so. Avenue. Yes, yep. correct. And then uh, tomorrow night we have an event at Wild Fang, which is like, uh, if you've read the book or the piece, the Wild Feminist t-shirts that are referenced in the, the piece, I, are, that's where those are from. Um, so we're very excited to partner with them to do an event. It's not a reading, it's like a book signing and mm-hmm. then a shopping event where they're going to give 20% off to people and we're going to have light Light LaCroix snacks. Oh, nice. <laughs> LaCroix and pizza because we're very classy. Um, and then Friday we're speaking at Google, uh, which is exciting. <gasps> really? Yeah, we're very fancy. Wow. And, uh, so we're speaking at Google during the day. And then in the evening we're going to have our big official book launch mm-hmm. at Books Are Magic in Brooklyn. And that will be at 730. And then we're going to have like some mingling to follow at 61 Local down the street. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's our that's our big event. Like come – Come hang out. Everyone come books. hang out. Yeah, come hang out to, at one or all of those events. Be and, a groupie. And then Sunday we're going to be in D.C. with Alexandra Petrie That's from awesome. the Washington Post, who is... Is, uh, another they, hero of mine. Are they interviewing you? Uh, she's going to be in conversation with, because that's okay. very much the, the trendy thing right now, to be in conversation with someone. Which, who better to be in conversation with than her? She's hilarious. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you so much. This is so exciting. And uh, this is just beginning. I mean, the book comes out so. and then you do a tour and but you can do book events for uh, as long as this book is out three or four years I you think. know yeah <laughs> at least does that know how it works <laughs> and it's in so it's 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 in paperback it's in paperback in the u.s it's in uh hardcover in the uk oh i saw the the, the yellow book is the, is yes, the uk version basically the same book yeah. it has some slightly different there's a few things that like don't translate where yeah, they'd be like oh we, we don't have, have target or yeah. we don't have you know like yeah. where you'd have to translate it to like what's your target um which by the way their version of tj max is called tk max that's an odd small change right yeah yeah tk max tk max so things like that yeah. or like you can't say a box truck you say a lorry so we went through oh. with a fine tooth comb for those references and there are more than you would imagine that's funny. or where they'd go um so we i was very sad because i had written a lot of this one but there was a one that got cut from the book that we will be reading at some events that was um a very private tour of paul newman's salad dressing factory where it's just the ghost of paul newman <laughs> who doesn't love paul newman everyone likes paul newman. everyone loves paul newman uh and so <laughs> uh that got cut from the book because they were like we don't understand this because we don't have paul newman salad dressing oh, what a horrible thing and i was like that's awful 
Yeah, you're like, I see a problem here. We need. I to mean, get they Paul knew Newman who he was as an actor, here. but yeah. they were just like, does he make salad dressing? And we're like, yes. uh, it all goes to charity. It's amazing. Yes. His popcorn is also very good. I know. So at, at any rate, they didn't get our references to like, <sighs> you know, passion next to the saccharoni sauce. Those must be very interesting email exchanges. <laughs> oh, inc- we've sent some really amazing emails back and forth where you're like, I never thought I would email these words yeah. to another professional person. Yeah. And yet here we are yeah. where they're like, mm, I'm not sure that's like the term here for <laughs> like whatever it is. But yeah, so it's been incredible. But th- we've had a really great team on both sides of the pond who really believe in this. And we've had an incredible response from our Belladonna community, from our Second City community, yeah. from our satire. I just feel like the satire writing community. We're so happy for you. Is Everyone is so happy for yeah. each other. Like when someone. I'm so excited. But that's another reason I love satire. Yeah. Because it's like someone does well and everyone comes around and is like giving them high fives yeah. and being like, you did it. Instead yeah. of like, that was my opportunity. Should have been me. Should have been me. Yeah. I feel yeah, like we all lift amazing. each other up. Yeah. So. Totally. Thank you um, so much for you're so welcome for having me here and for all your support of this book. Oh, of course! So pick up this book. It's a great. I mean, this is a great gift book. Um, it's a great very book good to holiday read. book. It's a great gift book. You can you can give it for Hanukkah and Christmas and Kwanzaa all the things. and and if you're you know New Year's gifts. Do people give New Year's gifts? I don't know. They this should. would be a great thing. Um, everyone's going to be you know with Thanksgiving and they're going to be with their families and they don't know what to talk about because everybody. Uh, uh, hates their family so this is a great book to bring everyone together they can just read from this book at the dinner table around the thanksgiving it will make your conservative fathers so upset (laughs) yeah absolutely and and it will give you so much to talk about or they'll just quietly go away and turn on fox news and then you Uh, just can go hang out wouldn't that be you should get you should get uh the people on the fox and friends to profile this book (laughs) Maybe they would. I don't think it would go the way we would hope. Yeah, probably. How, we did, however, do a show where someone uh, had the suggestion that people should send it, like they should buy a copy and mail it to their worst senator. And I think that's great. Like that would I would be love great. for like Ted Cruz to get a hundred copies of this and be like, "Damn it, what is this? I hate this." Pence, Pence would love this. There's two Pences now. Greg Pence, his brother, <sighs> his whiter, worse brother, somehow oh, yeah. <laughs> got elected to the House of Representatives. Oh God! What we need now is more Pence. We need more Pence. So, like, I don't know how that's going to go, but... You should have had... One of these can be... The next time can be written... Uh, a vignette can be written by Pence's wife. <laughs> can be very specific to Pence. I had lunch with a man today. <laughs> no! It was everything I'd hoped. <laughs> we had soup. <laughs> oh, Brooke Preston, everybody. I you can't follow that. Follow Brooke um, at her amazing Twitter handle, at Big U, which... I just learned is not how you say her Twitter handle. No, you say Bigu. Bigu. Yeah, Bigu. So like it's Bigu. B i g u is mm-hmm. her Twitter handle. Everybody, it's only yeah. four characters. I know, which is why I'll never get rid of it. It's amazing. I I sadly did not realize Twitter's full potential when I joined the site in two thousand eight, <laughs> and uh, just was like, this will be a fun thing to try for four weeks, yeah, and then move on. And so I can't let go of the four letter handle it's so great love it but it is like uh it's a silly nickname my husband and i have for each other because like what it basically is shorthand for is like when you are with your person and you have like like that culture of two where Mm -hmm. there's like there's only two people that are the same kind of weird and you Mm -hmm. find the person that's like your brand of weird so that's what we're like we're bigus that's what we are is like and i don't know it came from some long lost conversation that we don't know the origin of anymore so we don't know what it that was or (laughs) well but that part of it has stayed with us and so we call each other bigu so that's the story behind the Twitter handle. Yeah. So no one will ever forget your Twitter handle, even though to remember it, I say big U just because it's everyone a word. does. That's what everyone. I assume that everyone thinks I'm posturing there, <laughs> there is a rapper, a street rapper named. I think his is like Big U One. Oh no! And so occasionally I get like added. Yeah, I get yeah. like the the errant yeah. mention from like Rick Ross, who's like shout out to my homie, and I'm like, oh, it's me. And you're like, thank you. I I just want to send a selfie back. <laughs> my of, book. Like, yeah, I want to send a selfie back of like me in my kitchen in Ohio. That's like, love you. <laughs> like we're homies. <laughs> like I was just cleaning up. Yeah, I'd exactly. Say hi. Like I'm at, I'm volunteering at my daughter's kindergarten. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but I would hang out with them. Sure. I think I would make a great if addition. you're ever in. Athens, Ohio. Yeah, well, I live in Columbus now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Or, I mean, I'll come to Athens. You'll come to Athens. 
I love Athens. It's only a couple hours away. But yeah, if you're ever in Columbus, Ohio, come hang out. Um, so pick up this book. Um, what's the website for the book? Is it New Erotica New for Erotica Feminists? New Erotica for com? dot com. You has links to buy. There's a uh, handy book club kit that you can download for free. <gasps> Neat. To make it easy to make it your book club pick with like discussion questions mm-hmm. and recipes and games to play and uh, lots of you know fun things like that. So definitely go to New Erotica for Feminists dot com. Um, buy it request it at your local library um if your local bookseller doesn't have it please request it because that's really helpful that they can see that people want it and can you buy this for digital yes we have a an e-reader version and there's an audiobook version there's Uh, a narration of all of these vignettes this woman that did it is incredible her name is sunila nankani i really hope i pronounced that correct she's a professional audiobook yeah. narrator she did giselle's book no big deal hello so basically we're giselle is what i'm saying <laughs> and she uh just it had just the right pitch perfect voice for it and loved it and loved what we were doing so yeah there's an audio <laughs> you're like oh this book is hot did I, I write this book? i know i was like woo. i was like turns out this is a good book <laughs> Uh, but no, she was amazing and she just hit it just right to make it like sexy and funny and warm. And so um, I even if you buy the print book, I totally think the audio book is worth the additional. Yeah, it's it's a thin book. It's it's not a huge investment. It's not like get the audio book or both. Uh, join Audible for the free month or whatever the heck. Look, they can I do. love Michelle Obama as yeah. much as the next person. She's going to sell her books. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's yeah. all set. She's fine. She's going to do fine. We need our books. Listen we need our to, books. Uh, yeah, listen to this on the book, on the, on the Audible. New Erotica for Feminists. Satirical Fantasies of Love, Law, Lust, and Equal Pay by Caitlin Kunkel, Brooke Preston, Fiona Taylor, and Carrie Whitmer in bookstores now. Yay. Thanks for being on the big show. This is amazing. Thank you. It's so nice to finally meet you. It's so great to meet you. Um, follow uh, Brooke Preston at uh, Big uh, Bigu. But it's, it's bigger. It's spelled big U. I'm Marty Dunnix. Follow me at Marty Dunnix and uh, follow Weekly Humorous at Weekly Humorous. Sign up for our weekly e newsletter at weeklyhumorous.com. Buy digital issues um, at uh, weeklyhumorous.com um, and get the Android or uh, Apple, uh, Apple iTunes app in the Android or Apple iTunes app stores. Just look up Weekly Humorous for weekly digital issues. Um, thanks for listening. This is Talk Word, uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you, bro. This is so nice. You're the best. Oh, I'm trying.